Hello everybody, my name is Ian Kirk Patty Cake. I'm an author and robot and today we're doing a book review of The Low End Kid by Robert Crone. This was a book that we have been reading um, in the Loin stream for the last couple of weeks and um, what is there to say about The Low End Kid? Well, I was pretty stoked to read this with the Loin streamers and um, I'm still not quite sure what it is I read. The book boasts about being like an acid trip and I, and you know what, yes. I guess that you could say that is kind of how I felt every night after reading this book. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like one of those books where you ever read it and you're seeing all of these elements brought in and these different scenes brought in and you're waiting for the next chapter or the chapter after that or the chapter after that to, to introduce something that makes all of it just click into place and then you're like, oh, it all makes sense. I feel like I got a bunch of elements, but never that connecting line. <laughs> Let's see if I can make a little bit more sense with the plot, or maybe you can see something that I didn't through the synopsis. <laughs> so, uh, before we get started though, number one is Lemoy is currently live. Lemoy for July. Down below is the link to the uh, submission, the prompt, and hope to see you there. It's community pick this month, so don't hate me for it, please. And. <laughs> Uh, number two, Dead End Drive audiobook is on sale this month at Google Play and Nook, so go and catch that at a discounted price if you're interested in it. And I guess that's all that there is to say. So, synopsis. The year is sometime in the future. We're not really given a distinct a time, but it, I, uh, it doesn't really matter. The main character, Max Xander, is a low-ender living in a dystopian take of New York, while the minority rich folk live in flying towers known as the High Eight, and the majority low-enders live on the ground in the gutters of Brooklyn. Or, you know, the rest of New York, but we're mostly in Brooklyn. Max is massively in debt to Korean mob boss Cho. To try to get some cash, Max makes a deal with a couple of Cho's lackeys, the Vegas brothers. They're gonna collect some high-priced outlaws together and take home some bank. After striking a deal, Max is on his way home. No. After striking that deal with the Vegas bros, Max is on his way home when he sees a kid steal an apple from a nearby cart at the market and the kids immediately kill for it. Max, of course, is just shrugging it off because that's business as usual here in future dystopia land. Max knows he's going to need to stake out the place to catch the outlaws, so he goes to a local pawn shop to pick up some supplies. Too bad he's poor, so he really doesn't get any of the supplies he needs except for a broken pair of binoculars that he honestly didn't even really need, <laughs> but he still got him. He sets up his stakeout spot outside of where he saw the outlaws and he waits around for a couple of hours until the Vegas brothers appear. Then the outlaws finally return just at a good time. Max and the Vegas brothers pursue the three outlaws. After some explosions and a gunfight, the Vegas brothers are buried in the rubble, but Max still is able to claim the old woman outlaw as his ward. She's uh, twice his age, old enough to be his mother, probably. Her name is Zoe Shikan, and one thing that Max noticed during the battle was that the woman can run inhumanly fast, just like him. Hmm. Curious, but uh, why ask questions? There are no need for questions here. Max calls the authorities to pick her up and claims that he caught the captured woman all by himself so that he can take all of the money home on his own, even though he'd be using the money to pay off the Vegas brothers' boss anyway. It doesn't really make sense for him to do this, but okay. The authorities beat the woman before loading her into the car and Max leaves thinking, oh my gosh, what have I done? Why am I such a piece of shit? <laughs> we got a real quick turnaround on that one. Max returns to his rundown tenement where he's going to rest the night away, but not without passing by one of the other residents, an elderly neighbor. He gives the older resident what's left of his food bar that he was eating and then passes out in his room. Max dreams of the captured woman bound in chains, beaten and in pain. He tries to speak with her, but she can't hear him. Waking up from his dream, he tries to shrug off the guilt that he feels still from turning her in, but admits that he's a coward who can't do anything right. A noise in the tenement hall pulls Max from his room. A bounty hunter has come looking for him for claiming the old woman's bounty all on his own. Now, I'm not sure how the bounty hunter knows this because as we will soon find out, Max's bounty hasn't been posted yet at the local bounty boards or the internet bounty boards. So how this bounty hunter knows that, I'm not entirely sure. Max jumps from the window of his not first floor apartment and doesn't die, but runs off. Max then seeks refuge with his friend Dinks. Dinks 
<laughs> Dinx lives in a fortified abandoned fire station. He also doesn't actually like Max all that much because he's sure that Max is going to get him killed and to be honest, Max is kind of a major asshat. But despite the protests, Dinx still lets Max in and um they hang out for <laughs> they hang out for a while. You'll notice there's a lot of just kind of hanging out in this novel as well. Now, Jinx is an internet nerd who also browses high-ender forums about the collective democracy and mob rule. He's also, now get, now get this, he's also a hacker, formerly known as 4chan. I mean, he's just a hacker codebreaker. He, he's not 4chan. <laughs> when Dinks sits back at his computer, Max asks him to check the quarantine boards for his outlaw announcement because he wants to see if his money has been posted yet. Dinks says that the boards have posted, but Max's capture isn't there. So I ask you now, how did that hunter know what Max had done? I'm not entirely sure, and it's never addressed. Anyway, Max panics about the missing post because he needs the money so he can give it to Cho or he's going to get killed. Dinks keeps looking into the quarantine information when he realizes that he's being hacked and emergency shuts down all of his computers and so the bad guys can't track him and then gets mad at Max because Max is going to get him killed. <sighs> he also yells at Max about how selfish Max is, but neither of them do anything and Max continues to just hang out at Dinks' flat for another day or two because he's got nowhere else to go and he just doesn't want to risk running into the hunters by leaving the house. While he's uh, while he's wasting time at Dinks' place, he mutters to himself about how much of a bad friend he is, but he doesn't care that much about it because he doesn't bother leaving. <laughs> On the third day of hanging out with Dinks, Dinks is finally able to get back onto the net and joins some collective hunter boards. He finds Max's name finally, but the payment falls under processing instead of paid out. Then Dinks continues through the collective's underground websites where it's talking about pro-democracy stuff. The forum topics range from how corporations exploit workers to how the collective enslaves people through mob rule. Max and Dinks go at each other saying that in a democracy, your voice is heard and they argue the difference between a democracy and an ochlocracy, which is kind of bizarre since both of those terms legit mean mob rule. They pretend that they don't mean the same thing in their shallow arguments in what felt like to make a political point. A direct quote from the section reads, they tell us the collective is all our voices coming together and that society exists because of our combined will. We, as a group, have a say in how we run our lives. But in a democracy, you vote for some dink and hope they don't muck you over when they're running the show. So the confusion here might possibly just be due to lack of world building and or shifting ideas over time, but I'm not entirely sure since this really doesn't ever come up ever again either. Max doesn't believe anything in the universe matters, no one's voice matters, and everyone should just not care about anyone else and just do what they need to survive. Max picks at Dinks for thinking that he has friends on this bizarre forum and he's just a loser pretending he's friends with high enders who actually just really hate him. Dinks and Max stop talking now because Max is kind of an asshole. More hanging around ensues until Max finally decides that he's going to go and check on his payout in person. He goes to his mother's club known as the Luma Lounge. Naturally, Luma's lounge is a neutral ground, so even if he does run into mob bosses like Cho, Cho can't attack him or else he'll risk a turf war and ruining the peace treaty that they've all got going on. Then as Max asks about his payout, he's told to check back later because yeah, it's not ready yet or something. But then he goes and sits down at the bar where he meets and flirts with this super hottie McHot pants French girl named Addie. They drink together and express and sh mm, they drink together and she expresses how impressed she is because he is an accomplished hunter. Oof. Oof. Wow. And while they're talking, one of Patty's employees comes up to Max and says that Patty is ready to see him, so he goes upstairs to talk to Patty. Inside of Patty's office is not only Patty, but also Cho, saying that this kid owes him money and he wants it paid for in blood because this kid double-crossed his henchmen. Patty calms Cho by making a direct line from Max's payment account for Max's bank account that goes right into Cho's account, so when the payout comes for the outlaw, it'll go right to Cho. Cho is satiated by this and then just leaves. Meanwhile, Max swears at Patty for interfering and doing him wrong, and uh, then calls Patty a bunch of names, which upsets Patty. Patty now won't talk to Max. Max tries to apologize, but it does no good, so he leaves Patty's office dejected because he, again, he was an asshole. Upon leaving the bar, he runs into the French girl again, who gives him a token and invites him to meet her at a no-name bar on a different side of town for a possible job opportunity because she knows that he is a bounty hunter and uh, could use some money. So, uh, see you there, Max. See? 
Once their conversation is done, he goes to see his girl for her his ex. Once their conversation is over, he goes to his ex-girlfriend's house, Angelita, and um, she's waiting for a client because she's a prostitute. They talk about their future or their past that they used to have together. They have sex, and then they get into a bit of a fight where Angelita's like, I'm just trying to survive, and you want something bigger than this, bigger than us, so there's no future for us. So then Max leaves. Goodbye forever, Angelita. She is uh, never coming back. <laughs> Can somebody keep count of the elements that are brought in here just to never come back again? Uh, yeah, you'd have to put that kid that died at the market the day before, too, because that's like the farthest world building that we really get in this. The next day, Max arrives at the no-name sketchy bar to meet Addie for a secret job. Inside, he also meets the bartender, Alexander. Max turns the job down without knowing any of the details and leaves the bar. Addie follows after him with the intentions of convincing him to take the job. She offers, so so the way that she does this is by getting him to spend some quality time with her. So she invites him up to the high eight to see how the high enders live because she is a high ender. And of course, he accepts the opportunity from Hottie McHot Richer McRicherson. They get into Addie's flying car and head up to the sky. Addie gives Max something called Sweet Blue, a psychedelic drug high enders often imbibe on pretty much constantly because they can twist reality to their will while they are high. High-enders typically use the drug to change their appearance. The drug works on Max briefly, but is quickly out of his system because his natural mutant abilities to heal quickly also make the drugs run through his system super fast. Once they reach the high eight, Addie takes Max to get a makeover because high-enders dress in eccentric ways or they're sometimes naked. Addie's favorite designer is a gender neutral person who has no genitals because they've had them removed. While the designer is off working on Max's outfit, Addie is checking out Max's naked bod and notices he's got a giant cock, saying, oh yeah. That's what most dudes do on Sweet Blue is they when they change their appearance. That's exactly it. And Max goes, nah, baby, this ain't the drug. It's all me. And Addie is like, oh, oh, oh my. It's impressive. The clothing designer returns and explains how they worship Zalarian, the leader of the collective. They cut off their genitals to be more like Zalarian and to hopefully ascend to that level someday. Everyone wants to be Zalarian. After leaving the designer with his new outfit, Max and Addie head over to a party to meet Addie's friends. The group of high-enders are all high and decked out in funky looks. Some of them look like ghosts. One of them is a giant squid monster. Y you know, your basic stuff. Everyone is just hanging out, blasting, drinking, getting wasted, and eating. Max doesn't do much but eat because he's a low-ender and he's going to take every chance he gets to stuff his face. Eventually, he excuses himself to the bathroom, and while he's there, Addie's friend comes running in, sobbing, and now he just looks like a fat old Asian man. Addy gives the guy some more sweet blue, he drinks it, and then he turns back into a squid monster because now he is high again so he can control that kind of stuff. He goes back to the party. Max and Addy decide that it's time for them to peace out. Since they're no longer at the party and Addy isn't ready to go home yet, she actually takes Max to a random park in the sky somewhere where they've got propaganda videos playing on the fountains and water. They sit down and watch this alternate history thing going on where people are storming the presidential office, spitting on the president, burning American flags, and masked activists stare heroically off into the distance. Veterans and journalists are walked off to re-education camps in shackles, and it's claimed that they were the baddies who needed to be repurposed. Addy explains that everything that you have just seen is propaganda that was written by corporations, and the corporations and the collective can do whatever they want and do whatever they want. After that, Addie takes Max to her place where she shows off her bedroom that's designed to enhance the effects of Sweet Blue by allowing mental projections to change not only their appearance, but the environment. She recreates a setting for Shakespeare's Sonnet 18. The two of them have sex while Max learns how to control the Sweet Blue room with his own mind. Note that this will also never come back. When Max wakes up, he's alone. He finds Addie in the living room and she offers to make him breakfast. During this time, she informs him that the bedroom became a storm from his bad dreams. Max explains that he has a recurring dream where he sees a woman and a baby in a storm and screaming and the two of them are separated while the baby cries. And then he just wakes up and he doesn't know what it all means. They talk about farms in Russia while eating fruit for breakfast when Addie says, okay, we need to, we need to hurry this up because Alexander's waiting for us to do the job. Max is like, hey, hey, 
I never accepted this job. And Addy's like, yeah, but you're not going to say no because you're a cuck. And uh, Max is like, yeah, yeah, you're right. Addy and Max return to the no-name bar to formally accept the job from Alexander. The details of the job are then explained as this. Sneak into the re-education camp center place where the outlaw Zoe Shikan is being held and break her out. Max spends hours looking at the prison layout to figure out the best way to get in and out. After wasting some time, Addy and Max are suddenly in a vehicle on their way to the prison with an outlaw captive in the back. That's going to be their way in. The outlaw tries to get out of this by being... The outlaw tries to get... The outlaw tries to get out of being turned into the baddies by saying that he's a writer and the collective slash bad people of the story are just getting rid of writers because they're free thinkers and he's not really a bad guy. He's just against the people in power. Nothing he says spares him and this idea also never comes up ever again. Once Addie and Max are inside of the facility, they toss the outlaw into a storage closet and keep on with their mission. They ask a couple of caged prisoners which way they need to go to find Zoe Shikan, but the prisoners only agree to help if Addy and Max set them free. Max agrees to set them free, but he'll only set one free until they get Zoe, and then they'll come back and free the rest of them. They release a man named Jessup. Jessup shows Addy and Max to Zoe, and they free her. On their way back out of the complex, though, all hell breaks loose, and they must leave the other prisoners behind in order to escape. The four of them land back in Brooklyn to meet Alexander with their ward, but Alexander is not at the meetup spot. And since the group is still being pursued over the prison break, they don't wait around for him. The, the group escapes and finds refuge in an old subway safe house that belongs to Zoe. Addie excuses herself to smoke and give Alexander an update on their situation while Max checks on Zoe. Time skip and everyone is eating actual food like eggs and not synthetic packets like the pores usually do and I'm not entirely sure how they have eggs in this underground safe house but somehow they do. Zoe tells Max about this safe haven community she has called Avalon and how she'd like to take him there. Max says that he can't go without Addie because he's in love with her and won't leave without her. Zoe calls Addie a lying whore and says no she can't go to my freaking safe haven. Give it up Max. Jessup tells the group about his time fighting the Chinese back in 67 and says how all of the history people think they know is a lie. Jessup makes reference to knowing Max's dad, as does Zoe. After eating, Addie offers to clean Zoe's wound. While doing so, she drugs Zoe to make her pass out and then admits to Max that she also drugged Jessup because she needed to talk to Max alone. She tells him that she met with Alexander. Max is outraged that Addie lied to him. Alexander then appears out of literal thin air to tell Max that plans have changed. The job is no longer to bring him Zoe Shikan, but to have Zoe lead him to Avalon. Max refuses the assignment change, but Alexander laughs because Max has no choice. Do it or die, basically, because of his debt. Uh, he just, and uh, because of his debt and because he's actually kind of a pansy, Max, of course, just agrees. Max then asks what Alex wants with Zoe or Avalon, and Addie mentions a special red crystal called an aura being held at Avalon, and that's the goal. At Max demands to see what Alex's eyes look like behind his sunglasses, and and um, he lowers his sunglasses to show some little some little cubby holes with just blue crystals inside of them. Alexander tells the two of them to get the job done fast and then levitates out of the room and disappears again. Addie tells Max that Alexander controls the collective with his abilities. Max calls Addie bad names for lying to him, then immediately apologizes again because he's a cuck. The two then pretty much wait around for everyone to wake up. When everyone's awake again, the four watch a TV celebration at the collective's tower known as the Spiral. Alexander appears beside Addie's uncle, Roman Norris. Here, Zoe says Alexander is a Solarian. The TV celebration ends and everyone's playing cards until they pass out. Zoe invites Max to sneak out with her and ditch the other two and follow her to Avalon. Again, Max refuses to go without Addie. Hunters have now entered the subway and are on their way to kill everybody. Hunters have now entered the subway and uh, they're going to collect everybody. So everyone has no choice but to flee. Zoe still refuses to go to Avalon since Addie is with them, so instead they head over to Patty's bar. While leaving, the group is chased by robot dogs, but eventually they defeat them. At the bar, Max heads to Patty's office to talk to her alone about everything that's going on. She swears at him for being a stupid idiot while she panics on how to save him from Cho's wrath. The plan is to hand Zoe over to Cho so that Cho can collect the money, but before they can do anything, hunters have appeared at the bar and started ripping it apart. A gunfight ensues, Addie and Max make it out of the building alive, and he's also now discovered that Patty and all of her employees know Zoe somehow, but that really doesn't matter 
He's not asking questions. Max and Addie head over to hacker friend Dinks' house to hide from the hunters. Again, Dinks doesn't want to let them in because Max is going to get him killed, but he relents very quickly and lets the two in anyway. The, two, the, the couple of them hang out for a couple of days. While Max sleeps, he dreams of Zoe with Patty and Patty talking about the special crystals to heal Zoe so she doesn't die. It's revealed here that Zoe is Patty's daughter. The two of them bicker over how Max was raised. Then Zoe is like, I need to go and find Max. But Patty gets Zoe to slow down and rest while her employees go out looking for Max. The two of them fall asleep. Max wakes up to find Addie is missing. He goes looking for her and finds her sitting in Dinks' computer chair, cutting a tracking chip from her arm. She then tells Max about how... <laughs> no, no... That tracking chip never comes back, mind you. She then tells Max about how she was raped by her uncle as a child, and when she turned 13, her uncle and his associates prostituted her out to his friends. She escaped those bad situations by embracing her sexuality and learning to use her assets to manipulate people. She says Alexander helped her with her self-image by giving her sweet blue that let her become whoever and whatever she wanted while hiding her past scars. The moment and their plans for what to do next are interrupted as uh, hunters surround Dinks' house. It's okay though because pretty much immediately everyone that matters from the bar shows up and uh, fight the hunters and they escape. Since now it's not safe anywhere and they don't have anywhere else to turn to, Zoe has no choice but to take the group of people to Avalon. Once they reach the hidden underground city, Zoe introduces everyone to someone known as Old Man. This is Zoe's father, and he runs Avalon as the leader. He also has the desired red crystal in his cane. Of course, all the personal belongings of the travelers have been taken away as soon as they got to Avalon for the protection of those who live there. So without her sweet blue lace cigarettes, Addie is going through withdrawals. Since they can't leave, Zoe shows everyone to their rooms where they're going to just chill for a while. Addie's freaking out without her drugs, but there's really nothing that anyone can do. Addie is ready to betray Zoe right then and there immediately because she needs her freaking drugs. And she screams at Max that he'll be in trouble if he doesn't go and get that freaking crystal so they can leave. He said that he can't do it. She says, you don't love me then. Then she pretty much just cries until she falls asleep. Her sleep is interrupted by vomiting, and now that Sweet Blue is wearing off, Max sees her for all of the scars that her abuse left her, including some suicide scars on her wrist. Addie tells Max that he should go romantically be with Zoe because she's a better person, but Max says, nah, I love you. And Addie then laments how she can't have children because her uncle had her sterilized when she was a child. Uh, while they sleep more, Max dreams of Patty being murdered by Alexander in her office at the bar. Max, <laughs> Max wakes up panicked and goes for a walk around Avalon. There, he runs into Zoe in the hall, and Zoe goes, So, um, your girlfriend does a lot of drugs. And Max is like, yeah, she's had a hard life, though. Max and Zoe go to the rec room where there's a bunch of stuff to play with. Dinks, Jessup, and some of the others from Patty's bar are all there just kind of hanging out. They dance to music on a record player, and Zoe evades answering personal questions. Just as she's about to spill something personal and a secret, it kind of has to do with lineage, uh, security runs into the room and informs Zoe that someone has attacked her father. They go to the library where he was hanging out, and he's laying on the ground in pain. He says that Addie attacked him for the crystal, but she's been taken to the infirmary because she is very ill from withdrawals. How she got to the infirmary, but the old man didn't, I'm not entirely sure. Since they were theoretically in the same place, unless she attacked him, had withdrawals, ran out. But then how would he know? I'm not sure. Anyway, when the old man is brought to the infirmary, Zoe is ready to beat Addie into paste. The old man and the infirmary nurse kick Zoe out before she can do anything, but allow Max to stay for a little while. The old man and Zoe then bond after she apologizes. Eventually, the nurse kicks Max out too. He falls asleep in the hall right outside the infirmary. When he's woken up, Zoe and a couple of security officers are walking through the hall, entering the infirmary and taking Addie to interrogations to see why she was attacking the old man. Max follows them, then sits in an observation room during the interrogation. Zoe goes, how dare you take advantage of my poor, sweet, gullible Max. He loves you, you know. And Addie just laughs about it while... <laughs> Meanwhile, Addie just kind of laughs about it and then goes, Yeah, but why don't you tell him what happened to Patty, huh? And uh, when Addie says that, Zoe loses it, smacks Addie. The interrogation ends abruptly there. 
Max is leaving the room. He's demanding Zoe tell him what's going on. Zoe tells Max that something bad happened to Patty. Max doesn't want to believe it and wants to see it for himself, but he's told he's not allowed to leave. Since he's not allowed to leave, he starts wandering around Avalon until he runs into the old man that says, hey, I will show you a way out of Avalon so you can go check on Patty because it's not Zoe's decision to make for you. With the old man's help, Max leaves Avalon and he goes back to the bar to check on Patty and of, yeah, she is, she's kind of dead and Alexander was waiting for him, <laughs> as you might expect. Alexander tells Max that he needs to bring the crystal back immediately or else all of his friends are going to die. Max, not having any way to negotiate, just agrees and then heads back to Avalon. He meets the old man again and tries to take the crystal. When the old man questions him, he says, I have to do this for this agreement. And the moment is interrupted because, oh, wouldn't you believe it, the bad guys followed Max right back to Avalon so they could take the crystal for themselves. Most of Avalon is evacuated before Alexander gets there. The old man, however, dies at Alexander's hands. He takes the crystal, Max is shot in gunfire and passes out, and that allows the scene to end abruptly without having to actually work out the logic of how they escape or why Alexander didn't kill them right there. It's just, it's just, we pass out and it's over. And it's never answered either. Max wakes up somewhere he doesn't know. All of his friends are still alive and are just hanging out in a cave and by some abyss somewhere while Max heals. Meanwhile, dialogue is used here to make time pass by, going day one, day two, day three. Here's a random conversation with nothing actually happening but, uh, uh, but idle chatter. On day five, Max is finally awake longer than up for a little bit and asks what all happened. This is when he learns about everyone escaping to another safe house, but they're not invited because thanks to Max and thanks to Addie, nobody trusts Zoe anymore. And um, Max gets mad and goes, Zoe, why do you keep giving me chances? Because I don't deserve them. I'm a piece of shit. And Zoe goes, um, you're my son. So there's that. Then after a little bit more, Max goes, so how come I could heal so quickly? How come you could heal so quickly? And Zoe goes, gift from God. Everyone here just sort of bonds and wastes more time. They all fall asleep again and pass out until Max dreams of seeing the old man. The old man lectures Max about how the youth just don't listen anymore and then tells Max to prepare himself for what's to come. There's no such thing as coincidence. If actions have consequences. All situations are unavoidable. You're not a victim of circumstance. The devil's in the details. Once Max is done talking to the old man, he returns to the campsite to check on Zoe, but then everything shakes because there's an earthquake or something. Everyone goes to the surface to see some of the high-ender buildings falling from the sky. Zoe and Max build a makeshift hospital area and start running around to dig people out of the fallen rubble and treat wounds. Max and Zoe also go looking for some missing children, but only bring back one because the rest are dead. Uh, I mention this because it is just such a bizarre and long segment of this book that it doesn't have anything to do with anything and it serves no purpose toward the story and I don't know why it's here. In case anybody else that read this can like give me some information on this. Max then tells Zoe that he must leave to go and talk to Addie because Addie lives in those towers and she is in danger. He goes to the no-name bar to look for Addie but finds her driver instead. The driver takes him back to Addie's flat and Addie is unshowered and drunk and depressed and emotional and refuses to talk to him. Literally, she locks herself in a bedroom for a couple of hours or for a while and just blasts music until she finally gives up, comes out and talks to Max and uh, gets over it. They determine that the towers are falling because Alexander has the two crystals and some kind of equilibrium is off. And so they have to go and talk to Alexander to try to stop the buildings from falling. And, Ale and Alexander is in the spire. On the way to the spire, Max drinks three tubes of sweet blue so that he can look like Addie's uncle so they can sneak past the guards. However, that apparently wasn't necessary because once they get to the tower, all of the guards at the spire are pretty much just shells of their former selves and completely gone because of whatever is happening in this building. They climb the building to try to find Alexander and they run into some crazy old woman talking about darkness and chanting craziness, but that never comes up again. Max and Addie ascend to another floor where they finally find Alexander, who is now an old man, his energy and life drained from him by the crystals. He says, you're too late. Everyone is going to die. He couldn't control the collective. No one can. Good luck, Max. Get the frick out of here. He also says that the collective feeds off their will and their affliction is caused by their plight. I'm still not sure what this means in the context of the story because it really didn't give any context for that. And it feels like an area where world building would have been necessary to make that have makes where world building would have been necessary to make that make sense. 
Max de determines that the only way to stop the towers from falling and killing millions of people is for him to become one with the collective. He sends Addie out of the tower in their car after discovering that she's pregnant just by touching her belly because he is a magician like that. He then drops himself into a reflection pool of what's like hot acid. His consciousness is then merged with the collective. After a short period of time, Addie returns with Zoe and Zoe tries to talk Max out of sacrificing himself. He refuses because he believes it is better to sacrifice himself to save millions of people via controlling the collective than to allow the millions to die as technology fails. The narrative then goes into a bunch of exposition about Zoe and her husband and how Max was born and the drama in his family and how the superpowers came from the aura crystals being used at both Zoe's and Max's births. It's very odd, oddly inserted, and also hard to read because it randomly changes to a difficult font to read at this point. Max then tells Zoe that he no longer has emotions and she cannot persuade him to change his mind. However, she should leave the collective and go care for her coming grandchild. Zoe is convinced but reluctantly leaves Max to the collective. The chapter ends on the line, without autonomy, there can be no freedom. Now you'd think that the novel would end there, but uh, <laughs> you'd be wrong. It goes on for another 60 pages. Count them, 60. Oh, and in those 60 pages, you've got summaries of how the rebels and the outlaws took over the re-education island and now use it to imprison the high enders and Cho, the uh, the outlaw, so that Max doesn't have to pay him back. Though Ma Max is now a collective figment of imagination, so I mean, how can you force that to make anybody pay you back? Then you've got a turf war between the remaining mobsters that want Patty's land now that she's gone. You've got progression of the pregnancy. You've got alternation between Zoe's, Addie's, and Max's POV as Max moves in and out of dreams to communicate with Zoe and Addie. In Addie's dreams, Max and Zoe have sex by a lake, talk about the baby, talk about Addie's life on the, on the living side. In Zoe's dreams, Zoe's a typical 21st century mom whose son got his girlfriend pregnant while he's in college thinking about dropping out of college and she's upset. It honestly feels like an alternate universe fan fiction that's still just in this book because the dream stuff doesn't make any sense to me and if max can teleport himself into people's dreams because he's part of the collective why wasn't alexander doing this to get to zoe why wasn't alexander doing this to max why wasn't alexander doing this to anybody else in the story how is he getting into people's heads before this and then how is Max getting into people's heads with those premonitions before this if it's a collective specific power? I just don't know. When not in Dreamland, you also have Zoe going to Patty's bar to claim her territory in Brooklyn. The other mob bosses of New York City aren't happy with it, and Zoe has to prove herself worthy of joining their ranks. It's also at this point that the book becomes like a feminist novel as the boys get pissy when Zoe takes over and a female sultan boss of Queens says how impressed she is with Zoe and they should work together because girl power, they gotta beat the boys, blah blah blah. And then she implies she had some sexual relationship with Patty. Next, you've got Addie receiving a gun from her driver as she plans to take down her uncle who abused her as a child and reclaim her birthright, that is, her family's company. She calls a boardroom meeting and she shares information about how her uncle is not trustworthy since he ignored safety protocol that caused the towers to fall when that isn't enough to get him ousted. She then shares information with half of them of them prostituting her out as well as her uncle. They all vote out her uncle. He tries to attack her in an angry rage. She shoots him in the dick because we're in full feminist fiction now and Addie takes over the business. The book ends with Addie and Zoe living in the same 21st century house dream with Max standing outside on the porch when his uh, his grandfather, the old man, and Patty, the go and Patty turn into ghosts and appear on the porch and they all just kind of talking and laughing and bickering like a family and then Max pulls them into the kitchen where everybody is just one big happy family. The end. I know, I feel like we're reading a completely different book here in the final chapter. I just got, got, I don't know. I don't even understand what the point of this last chapter was. It is so completely different from the rest of everything else. It doesn't answer any questions. It doesn't tie anything up. It just changed the entire mood of the book. And honestly, it felt like it wasted a lot of reader time. I've been through this book four times now, maybe five, and I'm still having a hard time trying to figure out what exactly the plot was or what it was trying to say or what it was trying to do. The worst of it is every chapter that I read, I hoped that it would get better and elements would click and make it make sense, but every chapter I read 
just made it worse. The final chapter was the absolute worst with the dreams and the random subplots that were not at all involved with the overall story as we went throughout. There's another bizarre thing about this book. Every bit of information that I read about this book feels like I'm reading about a different novel. So not only did every chapter feel like a different book when it was introducing new elements, but book reviews or the plot on Goodreads or store pages or author interviews and even some Q&A on the Amazon store page, it all sounds like it's referring to a different book. And they're not even like, the conversations about these things are not even sounding like at least those are for a different book and then the book is a different book. It's like the Q&A is a different book. This other thing over here is a different book. This social credit score over here is, why does everything sound like it's a bunch of different ideas? I feel like these were the things that the author wanted to accomplish in the book, but they didn't actually make it there. But that's just me suppositioning. For example, <laughs> the author has a five question Q&A on his website where he mentions the involvement of the social credit score in this book. There is no social credit score at all in the plot line. The only times credits are mentioned is when he's talking about getting paid for things and doing bounties. But in no way does this ever allude to a social credit score or getting money for behaving a certain way or for your reputation in society. I went looking for interviews and information about this book to hopefully understand it better, but I came away more confused. A direct example of this would be in an interview on Hollywood into Toto, the author said, quote, I started with the simple idea. What if the heroes we worship today end up vilified in the future society, blinded by utopian morals? And to really turn things around, what if thugs became the champions who hunt the fallen heroes for money and glory? On the surface, the high concept story was intriguing enough for a generic action novel, but on closer inspection, it lacked a soul needed to make any significant impact on discerning audiences. So I'm interested in the story just described, but where is that story? In this story, you did not have people who refused paradise. You, you just had the high enders and the low enders, and there was no choice there. You vaguely have mention of heroes of today turned into villains of tomorrow with the arrest of soldiers, but that's not actually a main focal point of this, and it's really not explored in the culture of the story. You don't have the worship of the villains either. You don't have a society blinded by utopian morals. You have some people that are blinded by drugs, but that's not, that's not investigated either. And you definitely don't see glory for the hunters. They're just there standing around, sometimes doing their job, but mostly standing around outside a bar, outside of the firehouse, just standing. <laughs> and you think you get a sense of some of this through Max because of his position and his desire for money, but you don't. He feels bad for the first person we see him turn in, and he's given absolutely no glory by his community. You know, at least that would have been a nice character arc to show. But we're told Max is this badass who cares only about making money and bad decisions. But we see he has a conscience immediately. He's guilty and unpopular from the start, so I don't even know what book is being talked about in these interviews. As I've sort of alluded to, there is no world building in this book, and at times it feels like the author relies on you knowing vaguely what cyberpunk elements might sort of be through Blade Runner, but this book still isn't cyberpunk. There's not enough technology, and more importantly, the themes aren't there for this to be cyberpunk. Erwin, the author over on Minds, actually did a great post recently going through the history and elements of cyberpunk. I'm going to link it down in the description below because it is definitely worth a read if you're interested in writing the genre. Overall, though, in this book, we have no sense of society, no sense of structures outside of the rich live in towers and get high all day while the poor live in the gutters and barely eat food. There's the start of something, but it's never developed. And instead of developing world building culture and society that would have played into what the author mentions his goals are, we get a lot of nonsensical talking scenes where nothing happens and it just feels like a waste of time. I'm not trying to be mean. But I have to say that this book made me feel physically exhausted every time I sat down to read it for a couple of hours. The author also mentions in his Hollywood in Toto interview that he doesn't like agenda-driven stories, but many of the elements introduced in this specifically feel agenda-driven because they don't fit into the world building and or they're never properly explained. Propaganda videos, superpowers, pro-democracy forums, blue drugs, uh, rich people are always are always high and trying to manipulate what we all see. Every the, the gods are genderless, people that cut off their balls. Are the low-enders drugged? 
with the propaganda fighting factions and collective what is the collective is it technology is it a mental borg of high enders how does it control everything the way the collective was referenced throughout the book gave the feeling that it was doing completely different things and like it was written at very different times so that the idea of maybe what the collective was at the beginning of the book was not what it was at the end of the book and at some point the author did not streamline <laughs> or reconcile these two different, three different versions of what the collective was. That's what it felt like reading. I don't know what the actual plan was here, but that's what it felt like in reading it. We never learn what the collective was for, where it came from. There's only the vague reference that the collective took over all of technology and then somehow Max was teleporting himself into people's dreams as part of the collective after he lost his identity but also he maintained his identity and he needed to be an individual inside of the collective in order to have power i don't i don't really know the characters in this book were pretty inconsistent and unconvincing for who we were told they were addy started off as a french soldier spy badass became an insecure high ender holding on to her sanity barely with drugs and then turned into a trembling meek damaged girl and then went back into kill bill badass mode for no apparent reason we didn't see any character growth we saw convenience max was a clumsy dude a great hunter a debonair charming xander man a selfish dude if in it for the money used to people dying freaked out by crime and then a selfless sacrificial man again without any character growth it all just sort of happened as a convenience as necessary to put the plot where it was supposed to go we also didn't see any signs of residual or past relationship between, say, like Zoe and Alexander as mother and child, nor did we see anything between the old man or Patty and Alexander as grandparents to that one. It felt like the author suddenly decided that this was where the story was going to go at some point and then never went back to make adjustments to their interactions or to add hints or signs of their relationships to build up to the reveal in that case. The book even starts off with a quote from Max Xander saying, As long as you pay me, I'll believe whatever you say but this is never actually portrayed in the book. It's a rich idea and I would have loved to see this character, but we never got to see this character. And I wonder if it's because there's some hesitation to make the reader just not like your character at first and then give them a redemption arc. I'm wondering, because there are a lot of authors I've noticed that do not like readers disliking their character for any reason. So they go out of their way to try to avoid having their character do anything that could be perceived as bad or distasteful. On another note, so much of this book could have been cut for the sole reason that it was dialogue that meant nothing to the story. It was filler chatter going back and forth that changed nothing, did nothing, revealed nothing, was nothing. There were many times when the scenes were introduced in a paragraph or two only to be ended immediately because, again, there was no purpose, maybe except to show time passing, but then you didn't even need to do that, you could have just said and time passed. Even in going through the book again to write the summary that I gave you earlier, it was difficult to find the plot points because there were just so many pages of meaningless dialogue that didn't move the story forward. And I even left many of those hints in there of things in happening in the story that didn't mean anything. And tell me, how did we kill the main character and go on for another 80 pages in dreams and other people's climaxes that were never set up to give the reader a payoff? Almost everything in chapter 14 felt like it was either a setup for book two or it was fan fiction because the author wanted to keep writing stuff about the characters. And it dragged the ending on. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. So I'm not going to take any guesses at Robert Crone's politics, but I will say that the book felt like it was trying to be not so subtle about dropping political talking points and beliefs throughout, which is fine, you can do it. I know the Dead End Drive has some stuff in it and some stuff that I would honestly make subtler and shorter if it wasn't closed and done now, but you know, it gets over quick. But, this, but the way that this stuff is introduced in the story doesn't make any sense and it's sometimes so abrupt and never resolved by making sense in the story that it stands out. Some examples include this dialogue. We ended her life because every action has consequences. Your mistake set in motion this chain of events, and she was caught in the wake of your decisions. Though her death is tragic, it was nonetheless unavoidable. And this narration. Any evidence can be used against me just as easily as underlining the notion. We are all guilty in someone else's eyes. I wish that didn't go anywhere. And then this conversation between the old man and Xander. Please excuse the voices here. When I say there are no coincidences, what I mean is events do not happen by accident. You finding her that night at the terminal was not random. You chose to steal from a gangster? Coincidences? His men chased you. 
you chose to run on a path that led you straight to the one person in the world you needed most. Zoe being there was not by happenstance either. She chose to go on a mission, which put her in the location on the very night that you were in trouble. It's only a coincidence because you couldn't see all of the individual components in motion which guided you. Such reasoning implies you're a victim of circumstance. Are you not an active participant in your own life? If a person wrongs you, you can either seek revenge or offer forgiveness. Every decision has a cost. You have free will to make up your mind. But such freedom does not absolve you of consequences made by your choices. Drop a vase and it will shatter upon impact, which means that you can never use it again. Unless you drop it on a pillow, then it doesn't break. Aha! At last you're catching on. Catching on what? The devil is in the details. Like, that is legitimately the back and forth between these two characters, and I still don't understand the logic of this conversation. Can somebody fill me in in the comments below what I'm missing here? Because it feels like he's trying to put a bunch of talking points into these dialogues but I'm not sure what it's trying to actually say. Bottom line is I found this book on social media advertising by the author, similar to Stay Tuned by Liam Baker, which I've reviewed on this channel, who went onto a podcast and super chatted to have his book read. So I did. At the very least, your marketing is working. You got to you got a reader in both cases. This book feels like it was written over a long period of time because of how the different ideas are from one chapter to the next and how the mood shifts, but I'm not really sure what the production time was on this. There are just so many ideas here that never got built into a cohesive climax, and while I'd hoped that every chapter would bring clarity, instead I was brought more confusion and ultimately left more and more unsatisfied the further into the book I went. If you haven't read this book, consider checking it out and let me know what your thoughts are on it. I'm just kind of glad I can now move on and so can the loin stream. But now it's time to finish the Fighting Storm trilogy. I'm so close to the end of that one too. <laughs> so anyway, that is my review of The Low End Kid. Please let me know all your thoughts and more down in the comments below if you enjoy the sort of video or the information that comes out here. For Please remember to like, share, subscribe for more. If you have any books that you would like me to critically read, uh, give me give me book titles down in the comments below. I think the next book that I'm going to read will be called Beauty Queens by Liba. I can't remember what her last name is now, but I will be posting on social media when I start that book. I still have to finish Woven by L.E. Iyer, so <laughs> I'm at about 70% with that one at least. Thank you so much for watching. Um, until next time, have a good week and uh, have a good Monday and don't die. The only people who should come are those who want to meet their monsters. If this is what Agatha wants, I don't know how we can even dispute it. Show me your teeth. I change lives, baby. And I end them. Sweetheart, no bargains hold. Only fools no restraint. Only losers lose! If your scissors are dull, may I recommend sharpening them with leather? I think I hit you. Mima says I must have a guardian angel. To enter the ring but abstain from playing is suicidal. Your virtue makes you nothing but a liability. You're gonna die. You're gonna die. You're gonna die.